Okay, can somebody tell me if they can hear me or talk back to me so I can hear you? You guys are still on it. Let's go here and do this. Colleen, can you hear me? Colleen, no. Yes, I can hear you. Oh, good. Thank you. Okay. Now I know I'm good and I can hear you. Thank you. Okay. So we're not doing this till seven, right? Right, you can go okay. away. I just needed to. No, make I'm sure just, I'm good. just here. I have, I'm watching the live, so I'm good. <laughs> oh, okay, awesome. Hi, Kit. I can't, you're on uh, mute. I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. Hi, kid. Okay. Ha, I, I just put this, I was adding, doing some stuff on my, um, on my, on Word, on another, on my desktop, I'm on my laptop, I can't do the other, on, um, I can't do Zoom on my desktop. Anyway, all of a sudden I get halfway down and it disappears. <gasps> oh my gosh. Of course I didn't save it. <laughs> Greatest nightmare right there. There you go. You look nice. Okay. okay. So do I have instructions for this evening? Or? Yeah. Uh, okay. So we don't, we're not, we're not, we're a recording right now, just so that you know. Okay. I can put the recording, stop it, but we need to stop it in a half hour. Do you want me to do that? To stop the recording? Well, I yet yeah, record. Okay, just so that everybody knows you're being recorded. Did well, I'm getting an echo. Uh, turn, turn, go to mute, and that should probably help. So we're going to have everybody mute here in just a minute. Did we answer Carl's question about is Brown County an SD10 or SD24 for this convention? Did we answer that? I messaged him privately. It's an SD10 okay. for this convention. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, where are we now? 124. <laughs> nice, and we have five minutes. Cassie, I heard fabulous things about your presentation last night. Did your husband tell you I saw him today? Yes, he did, yeah. Um, yeah, this is my fourth fourth convention training in the last uh, four days. <laughs> you have it by you know it by heart, right? Well, uh, yeah, I, I've seen how the sausage is made on this stuff, uh, but I've I've gone as as a delegate to the last ten. Well, this will be my tenth, uh, but then working for the state party uh, and seeing the backside of things, uh, <laughs> I know that perspective too. <laughs> yes, you got the whole ball of wax. Wow, that's yeah, that's good stuff, Cassie. That's great that you're willing to do this. Yes, it is. Because I know you've got to be exhausted. <laughs> yeah, but the more people know going in, the smoother yes. things happen, and the more efficient and effective and the less frustrated people get. You know, we, we get to do the business instead of, you know, doing the frustration and the fighting. That's not what we want. So happy to do it. Well, I'm excited about it. I'm excited to see so many TFRW members serving on our committees that we're going to talk yes. about. Yes. Yes. Um, 
because that's a that's a very important part of the convention process. Mm -hmm. Very important. You're right. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. This is Tommy Worthy. Hello, Tommy. Tommy. Welcome. <laughs> How are y'all tonight? Great. Thank you for joining us. Well, I just got home from seeing a movie. That Sit on. Push to mute. Maybe it'll help. Do um, what? I think you're going to want to ask everybody to mute. Um, it, we got two minutes out, so I think that would ex, um, might be helpful. Go ahead and do that. Yeah, I would do okay. that. Except uh, can't, you can't mute because you have to open it up. <laughs> so you don't. I won't mute. <laughs> but I will mute after I open it up. <laughs> It looks like okay. we have a whole lot of um, either first timers or it's been a while timers. Um, if you haven't already, uh, let us know uh, if this is your first state convention in the chat um, or, you know, how many you've been going to. Let's see if we have a little competition. See who's been going the longest. Um, yeah, my husband just said he's an old timer. Well, <laughs> yeah, he's been going longer than me. <laughs> Wow, look, everybody is chiming in. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> it's great. I love this energy and feel it. Let's chat. Don't, don't, don't. Valerie, um, I, I see you have a, your hand raised. If you'll put uh, in a moment when the chat slows down a little bit, if you'll put your question in the chat, we'll be happy to address it for you. Thank you for okay. doing this, Cassie. It's Corinne. Good to see you, Corinne. Thanks okay. Being here. Yes. All right. It's 6.59. So I'm just going to start with a little introduction so then we can get started right at seven. Uh, my name is Kit Whitehill, and I am the Texas Federation of Republican Women President. And I want to thank all of you for being here. We are up to 190 people almost. It's changing rapidly. But, um, and I want to thank Tony Ann DeShield. This was a, a co sponsored event by Tony Ann and the Texas Federation of Republican Women, led by the fabulous Cassie Daniel Howe, who I don't know anybody else who could do better training for convention than Cassie. And um, I just thank you so much. And tonight, we're, she is going to explain everything about convention. Everybody, please be sure you're muted. And if you have a question, enter it in the chat, and we are going to keep up with those questions so that Cassie can answer them. And um, I, you know, she's gonna answer even questions like, what do you wear? And what is, how does voting work? And what, what is parliamentary procedure? So she's gonna answer it all. And um, Cassie, I think I just wanna go ahead and let you get started because you have a lot to cover tonight. So thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody who's on here and taking the time tonight. Um, I'm gonna give you a heads up. This could be about an hour and a half and it's gonna be a lot, um, but we're recording it. And uh, we will send out the training video as well as the PowerPoint so you can go back and review anything or take any notes or whatnot that you'd like. So um, first of all, thank you, Tony Ann and Kit, for your leadership and your mentorship. Um, Y'all are the ones who sparked this idea about, hey, let's do a training. And um, so there's at least, you know, almost 200 people, over 200 people now um, that are going to get some great information. So um, I will say if you have any questions, uh, if you'll put those in the chat instead of raising your hand, uh, if you'll put those in the chat, that's how we'd, we'd like to address those questions. So uh, Connie, like if you have your hand raised there, if you have a question, if you'll put it in the chat and then uh, we'll address it as we go through the presentation. So let's get started. So what is the purpose of a convention, right? Why are you going? Um, well, first you have to elect party officers. Um, every two years, we elect a state chair, a vice chair, and then you and your Senate district will elect your state Republican Executive Committee members. So that's SREC. And uh, basically, those are that's kind of like the board of directors for the party in between state conventions. So if you think of it like a business, that's like a board of directors. So um, we also create and adopt the governing um, paperwork and, and rules for the party, including the party rules. 
uh, the platform. And then, you know, new, if you haven't been in a long time, legislative priorities might be a new thing for you. We've only been doing it uh, for a couple of conventions. So, um, and then just as a side note, just so you know, next time in two years, we will also be electing a national committee man, like Tony Ann right now is our national committee woman. And so we'll have those elections every four years. And those two individuals plus the state chair is Texas, Texas's <laughs> uh, representation to the national party, to the RNC, the Republican National Committee. Um, and then also in those presidential election years, we'll elect delegates and alternates to the national convention and our presidential elector. So the upside is we don't have to do all that stuff, which would add a whole nother day to the convention. Um, so we're only, we're only doing a couple of days this time, but just want to want to let you know what to expect two years from now. Um, other things that happen at state convention, you get to hear from statewide elected officials, um, other Republican leaders around the nation. Um, they're also gonna have lunch and learns, which just a heads up, lunch is not provided, but it's an opportunity to learn a little tidbit about different topics or um, training or things like that. And we'll go over that a little more later. Uh, there's also all kinds of fun events. Um, you know, a lot of the elected officials have events, a lot of organizations, you might have a dinner or a lunch, we're going to talk about some of that later. Uh, and then one of my absolute favorite parts is the exhibitor booths. Um, you can get all the red, white and blue sparkle you can possibly think of in any kind of format. Um, they'll have shirts, hats, um, but you'll also have organizations to give out information or to come speak at your county party or your Republican women's club. So great opportunity there. There's going to be a lot of acronyms that might come up. So this is just a small sampling of what those might be. Um, County Executive Committee might not come up in, at the state convention, but it's good to know. Uh, so just, just, just for your edification there, RPT is the Republican Party of Texas. But if you ever need to go to the website, which a lot of the convention information is on the website, it's actually going to be at texasgop.org. And Texas is spelled out. So T E X A S gop.org and then click the convention button. Just gonna make sure we don't have any questions. Okay, great. Um, so next up, I would ask you to raise your hand, but we can't see everybody. So if you're on video, you can raise your hand if you'd like, but who has already registered for the convention? Okay, great. Um, so that's really kind of a pro tip is pre-register. Um, it, it helps avoid lines. And um, that way you can also get tickets to the events that you want to participate in, the like congressional luncheon or the, um, the, uh, geo, the uh, gala that they have. Um, so make sure that you pre-register to avoid that long line. If you don't pre-register, um, you get to stand in a really long line at convention to register. Um, I will say the facility fee, if you're a delegate uh, or alternate, is not by law is not required. But being good conservatives, we like to pay for what we use and pay as we go. Um, so that is only a small fraction of the actual cost of putting on the convention. Uh, but if it's the difference of you being able to participate in the convention or paying the facility fee, then that's okay, right? Um, as, as Republicans, we trust you to make the best decision for yourself, personal responsibility. So um, once you, once you either register or go through the line and say, I'm not paying the facility fee, then you would go and pick up your credentials by Senate district. Um, on the Zoom that we had last night, there was some confusion about which Senate district that you're going to be in for the convention. And for the convention, you will be participating in whatever Senate district you voted in in this last primary or runoff election. So if you, um, if you look on your voter registration card, that will tell you which Senate district you will be caucusing in and seated in for this convention, okay? Uh, if you have any questions about that, uh, you can reach out, um, you can reach out to, to us or to me at the end of the email and we will help you sort out where you're at. Um, a lot of people are asking about registration. That's good. Uh, if you'll go to texasgop.org, and go to the convention tab, all the information will be there to register. And when you register, it'll allow you to purchase tickets if tickets are still available. I don't know the status um, of, of the tickets um, right now. So um, 
Okay, uh, these are the times and locations for where your credentials can be picked up. Um, when we see GRB, that's the George R. Brown Convention Center. So if you see that acronym anywhere, that just means it's at the convention center. Um, the two kind of main locations are the Hilton of the Americas Hotel and the convention center, but it should reference that on any material that you're seeing. When you pick up your credentials, you're also going to get a little swag bag, which always has fun stuff in it. Um, I would really, actually, I didn't think about this before, but pro tip, everybody's bag looks the same. <laughs> so you might even take a luggage tag uh, and put it on the handle of your bag. So you 100% know that that's your bag. Um, when when, when 9,000 people all have the same bag, it's very easy for someone to just pick the bag up and run off with it, not realizing it's not their bag, right? Uh, so, so there's a pro tip, put a, put a luggage tag or some kind of ribbon or something on that perhaps so you know it's yours. Uh, but in there, you'll also find your program and your program will have more thorough details about like the general sessions, who the speakers are and what order and you know layouts of the maps and stuff for the convention and things like that. So it'll be great to familiarize yourself with uh, and get prepared to have a great convention. Um, someone likened it to going on a cruise and taking your highlighter and they have like all the things that you can do and you go through and you highlight the events or classes or whatever that you wanna participate in. It's kind of what you get to do. So. Uh, let's see, I'm just checking uh, most of those questions we're going to get to, so I'm going to skip over them. Um, so the state convention committees, this is the next part, because they actually start work on Monday. Well, some of them actually have already been doing work. <laughs> um, and I'll just do a reminder, if you have questions, if you'll put them in the chat. And if I haven't answered it, it probably means I'm going to later in the presentation. Um, so talking about the temporary committees. Um, this is just how they're selected. So if you want to serve as a temporary committee member in future, this is the process. And that's how uh, the folks representing you currently were selected. Uh, the state Republican executive committee members, you have a man and a woman for your Senate district, recommend one delegate, and we have to be a delegate to state convention to serve, to the state chair, then that's who the state chair appoints. If the two members uh, recommend two, you know, each one recommends a different person, then the state chairman has to appoint one of those two people. Um, if they don't appoint anybody, then the state chairman uh, gets to appoint whatever delegate they want from that Senate district for that role. Um, same thing applies to the caucus chair. The SRC members uh, can, you know, recommend the same person, two separate people, or if they don't recommend anybody, then the, then the state chair can pick uh, whoever they want from that uh, Senate district who is a delegate. Um, you have to be willing to serve, which seems kind of obvious, uh, but there are extra expenses out of your own pocket to go and serve on these committees. So um, to see the convention committees, and we're highlighting a few of our TFRW members who are serving on committees or have served on committees here shortly, um, but if you uh, are selected to serve, then you're usually starting either Monday or Wednesday before the convention out of your own time, your own dime for health, hotel room expenses and things like that. So I will turn that over. We're gonna start off with Tony Ann, uh, who's gonna give you some information. Uh, uh, we're gonna go through these individually, but we'll start off with Tony Ann about platforms and resolutions. Um, do I need to stop sharing my screen? Yes, I, I can press that button there and, and have that and then go in. Okay, so we can go here. I Hi, everybody, and it's so good to be here. Um, Cassie, gosh, you are wonderful. I, I'm just so glad that I can help and be a part of this. I, I This is the, um, the website that Cassie has been speaking about, and I wanted just to quickly go over some really important parts of this for the platform, because this is the first time they've actually done a couple things. And I think it's really important that we know this. And, and the thing is, this platform is what we live with for the next two years. Right now, we have 337 planks. If you go to about on the homepage of the RPT website, you can go down to platform, click on that, and it will take you to the, um, it'll take you to our current platform. And that's kind of like their base. 
but they've been receiving all these resolutions and all these statements since our precinct convention. And Cassie made the comment that yes, they have been working ahead of time. All of them, when they make a commitment, it is really a big deal. Um, I'm gonna take you now so you can see what's going on with the platform committee. This is the first time they've done this. So what I want you to see here is that you would click on convention and this might be running a bit slow. There you go. And then you see at the top here, 2022 state convention. What you're going to do is you're going to scroll down. There are two things here. One, the first, you're going to go here to the platform committee information. But I also want you to see if you if I doesn't get brought up again, there is the state, um, this draft schedule. Very important. They're updating and you get to find the room numbers and everything. But you see here where it says platform committee information. You click on that and then it takes you to this page is what it does. This is what is new so that you know, there are 11 subcommittees. Now you each, you know, you can't be passionate about all 337 planks that we have right now. You kind of focus on different ones. Here's the opportunity for you to be able to participate if you get there early or um, on Monday or Tuesday, but they the first group is the platform. You'll see it there, the national defense, finance, constitution issues, issues, criminal and civil justice, health and human services. Let me just say there's 31 members. Cassie went over that a moment ago. And each one of them is assigned one of those on Monday so that that's what constitutes Though that's what will be the subcommittee. You'll see the room number, okay? So that's important to know that because if you want to go and testify about uh, one of these, then you can end up, let's see if I can get this to go up. There we go. You can go and you'll see where they start. The first uh, 11 to 1230 is the committee of a whole, but then it breaks it down and it gives you the room assignment. So if you have something that you want to testify about, make sure that you either get there on Monday and testify or you find out who is representing you and find out who is on that committee and that they have a say and they can hear, have you, they would be your voice. So you have those right there, see those five there. Now on Tuesday, we're down to four. So as I said, uh, I said 11, I think there's nine um, committees. So then, you have these subcommittees for Tuesday. Again, here's the schedule. Ladies and gentlemen, this hasn't ha haven't, has not been posted before. This is crucial. You have an opportunity. We are blessed in Texas to be able to be a part of the platform and to what it's going to be for us for the next two years. So go to this page. It breaks it all the way down. And these subcommittees, they talk. They come up with issues, they present it to the committee as a whole. And you'll see on Thursday, that's when the committee as a whole comes together and they start talking about each committee is going to discuss what the subcommittee, excuse me, and they bring it to the committee as a whole. And that's how you're developing our planks. I understand they're up, they got 300, more than 337. They want to consolidate. They want to get down to that 300 mark or less, maybe. I don't know, but go there. If you're getting there on Wednesday or Thursday, take the time. As you can see, they're meeting all the way until 10 o'clock at night. So, I mean, you can have an opportunity. Well, if you look on uh, Wednesday, they're meeting at 1030. Go over and participate. See what's going on. It is so crucial to listen and to be a part and have your voice heard. So I would think that that might, oh, and they are going to, well, they might live stream it. They're gonna live stream the committee as a whole. We're not sure if they're gonna do it for the subcommittees, but they, if you need to find out what's going on, you can uh, watch for the live streaming as a committee as a whole, which will be on Thursday. Cassie, I hope that that would, um, that covers everything that we might wanna say about platform. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Um, yeah, these are these are compiled from all over the state, and then their job is to try and pare it down 
And, uh, you know, if we have a thousand uh, resolutions about border security, we don't want a thousand planks about border security all kind of saying relatively the same thing. So they get the heavy task of um, paring it down uh, and then presenting that, that report to the body for the whole convention to vote on. Um, so I will. Oh, oh well, you can, never mind. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no, no. That I, I think will be brought up later about the voting later yes. on on all the committees. Yes, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna... okay. Let me get back to Sharon. Okay. From current slide. Okay. So uh, skip to the... next up, we'll have Janice Holt. Uh, who is serving on for Senate District 3 uh, on the Temporary Rules Committee. Janice, will you give us a rundown of what that committee does and how people can participate or be involved? Sure, absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you, Cassie. Thank you, Tony Ann and Kit for providing this opportunity. Uh, it is so important for everyone to be able to understand what's going on. As I was scrolling through the chats, there are so many who are first time uh, and so it's so important to know. I remember my first time to a convention, I had no idea uh, what was going on. You know, we're learning as you go, but uh, so thank you for providing this opportunity. The rules committee, um, you know, every time there is uh, meetings, there are rules that have to be followed. And a lot of times they fall back to the Roberts rules, but uh, the uh, Republican party of Texas has developed a set of rules uh, and again, a while ago, Tony Ann was uh, looking at the RPT uh, website, and in that list, there was also a tab that you could click on that uh, has the rules. And it is a 38-page document uh, of rules that have been developed over, over time, over the uh, convention committees uh, in the past. And so uh, I just want to just kind of briefly talk about how that is broken down. Um, it's broken down into sections. Um, Rules one through nine have to do with just general uh, general rules for all conventions and meetings. It, that has to do with our meetings, uh, the committee meetings, as well as the, uh, the convention itself. Rules 10 through 18 are more general rules that apply to the convention itself uh, for all conventions. And then it gets more specific as, it, uh, as we go on. Rules 19 through 22 have to do with precinct conventions. Everyone who is a delegate to the state convention has attended a precinct convention and a county convention or a Senate district convention. And so when you got there, if you recall, you were uh, the, whoever was the chair of those uh, precinct or county conventions had uh, a play, a script that they went through. And those scripts come from the rules that were set up um, in the uh, in the party rules. So uh, rules 23 through 32 have to do with the county convention specifically. Rules 33 through 42 have to do with the state convention. And then rule 43 and 44 have to do with candidates. Um, in the past, those have been uh, rules, rule 44 specifically has been a rule that has uh, had a lot of debate. Uh, I'll just kind of leave it at that. It's had a lot of debate on how that rule should be worded. But I encourage you, uh, you know, I just printed it out and I have it in a book here and you can take it with you, uh, with you to the convention so that you'll have it. Uh, and just like uh, as Tony Ann was talking about the planks of the platform, you can also attend the meetings uh, for the rules committee. And you can attend and uh, bring forth uh, your opinion on rules. Maybe you, maybe something um, at a precinct convention you think needs to, uh, there can be something added to that so that it can be uh, a little more clear. Uh, or maybe it's something uh, specific to the candidates, which is that rule 43 and 44. So uh, we are meeting on Monday. Uh, we begin at 11 o'clock on Monday and we'll be there at the George Brown Convention Center um, and what we will do, first of all, is set up the rules of our committee and uh, adopt those rules. And then we will begin the breakdown of going through every rule. And uh, if there is anything that needs to be changed, amended, uh, uh, you know, anything that we need to, uh, to do to make those rules better, we will be working on those. And as uh, Cassie said earlier, um, the, the committee is made up of one person from every Senate district, um, and then the chairman is appointed. And so uh, Steve Evans is the chairman of the Rules Committee, and right off the top of my head, I can't remember which um, C 
Senate district he's in, but uh, we will be meeting in room 330 A and B uh, at the convention center, rule three, room 330 A and B. And uh, like I said, we'll begin on Monday at 11 o'clock. And so some people say, well, why do I want to, why would I want to change something on the rules? What, how, why are the rules important? And the rules are important because it gives you a path. It, it, it's the map that allows all the other processes to actually come about and uh, in, a, in a way that is professional and in a way that is less, you know, causes less confusion and less chaos. So we want to make sure that every rule that we have, we want to make sure that that is something that uh, has been thought through on our rules and that we're not just excluding someone or including only this part or, you know, or whatever that may be. So um, if you have something that is something that's close to you and that you want to uh, talk about, well, please show up. Uh, I, have all, I have already received an email uh, from two or three different people of things that are important to them. And you know how they want maybe a rule that needs to have something added to it or taken away from, or they don't like this or that. Uh, and so that's what this is for. It, it is for us to be able to look over those rules and then decide uh, for the betterment of the Republican Party of Texas, will that thought that someone has, will it make it better or will it make it worse? Because we always want to make it better. And so, um, so come, uh, come and testify, uh, come and watch. Uh, to learn how this works is, you know, this is the best way to learn how the convention works, to show up for these con uh, committees that meet prior to the convention. And, um, you know, and, and also get to know your SREC member in your Senate district. If you want to serve on the rules committee, or if you want to serve on credentials or, or, or whatever it is that you may want to, make sure you know that uh, SREC person that represents you in your Senate district, because that's the way that you can become more involved and be uh, be selected. Let them know that you would like to do this and you would like to serve on rules. You'd like to serve on credentials or whatever it may be and keep up with them from this moment, you know, uh, all the way through two more years. So uh, anyway, thank you, Cassie. Um, and we'll just wait to see if there's any questions at the end. Excellent. Um, we're going to talk, uh, and if you're off mute, uh, so please mute yourself. If you're not speaking, um, but we we do have some some folks asking questions in the chat, and we're writing those down. Um, we're going to cover a little bit of those questions a little bit later. Right now, we're just talking about specifically what each one of these committees does. Um, so thank you, Janice. Um, I personally think a lot of people think the platform is the most important part, and it's definitely an important part. Uh, but I personally think that the rules are vitally important because um, that that's what governs our party um, so that we can enact the platform through those legislative priorities. So that being said, uh, the next one we have up is legislative priorities. And uh, Debbie Duke, I think you're on the line with us. Uh, and I'll hand it over to you to tell us about what that is. And uh, if you know any subcommittees that you're on or how they're being broken down, uh, you can give us that report. All right, thanks, Cassie. Thank you. And all right, my name is Debbie Duke, and I'm serving as the temporary legislative priority committee member from SD22. So shout out for all my SD22 folks that are on the line. Um, a little bit of background on the legislative priorities. As Cassie said, it's a very new um, committee. Uh, I think it's it's. I think this is a third convention um, that we've actually had it in in existence. And it's, it's because our, our platform is so big with those 337 planks that we, um, as delegates, uh, as a body, we focus in and vote on these top priorities so that we could work on legislative uh, matters. We, we form, can, the SREC or the RPT actually forms committees around what we end up voting for, um, for these uh, uh, legislative priorities so that we can be productive and, and get something uh, forwarded on that. And the other priorities are just as important, but these are ones that committees are formed around. So we all work on the other ones individually and uh, work on getting those forward. Um, we've already heard about how the uh, committees are made up. We'll, we'll, we will vote on Thursday in our first uh, Senate District Caucus to uh, make those permanent positions. Uh, you know, they, you can either vote to 
I don't know. I temporary on there or um, vote to replace them if for some reason you want to do that. Um, for the legislative priorities, I'd have you refer, refer you to the rule uh, number 33 and number 40, uh, 34C. Uh, 33 just kind of tells you preliminary that, that the temporary committee does tem uh, preliminary deliberations for the purpose of making recommendations to the permanent committee. And then uh, 34 seeds tells you that the legislative priorities, uh, the committee shall recommend to the convention proposed legislative priorities and re uh, related resolutions, no more than 15. But when we're done um, in general session, we will have eight and those our delegates are the ones who will be voting and determining on what those eight are. So that's, you know, you can see how important your, your uh, position is as a, a delegate or an alternate um, in determining these. Um, you can uh, show up to present and testify for your desired prior priority. You gotta be a delegate or an alternate to, um, to testify in front of the committee, plus some officials and, and stuff. But since we're talking to, to delegates and alternates, I'm just gonna leave it right there. Um, There'll be some type of registration when you go in so that we can be grouping uh, the topics together. Uh, really, it's probably gonna be your name, um, what your topic is about and what Senate district you're from and uh, probably county. And um, so after you get through there, it's a waiting game. Cassie will give you some tips, I'm sure, on, on some of that waiting. Uh, we have to, it's just different because it's a new committee plus we're reliant upon resolutions uh, committee work as well. So if you come in and testify, just be brief, be succinct, uh, make your point quickly and don't dilute your message. Uh, there will be a lot of testimony given over the three days and you want the committee to remember what you had to say. So get right to your, to your big points that you want to get across. Um, also bring three, three hard copies and drop off a copy with the secretary uh, and the chair of the committee. Have it in your, your phone or your, your um, laptop or something so that you can provide a digital copy um, to the email address that, that should be provided there so we can keep it all in one place. You can also go to the texasgop.org website that, that we've already shown you and go into that convention uh, tab and, and down about halfway, right before where Tony M was showing you, there's a, uh, a link to the committees that will show you all the committee members on the, on the different committees. Now there's their email there. So I would encourage you to look up the, the person that's representing your Senate district and send them an email about um, uh, priority matters that you uh, might want to be um, involved in there. And also, let's see. Okay, I think we'll start meeting at 11 o'clock on Monday and at eight o'clock on, on Tuesday. That schedule is in the, the agenda as far as the location. And then you want to, um, we'll, we'll do no more than 15 are allowed to uh, legislative priorities come out of the committee. Uh, and ultimately eight legislative priorities will be chosen. So um, we look forward to seeing you at convention. This is a, a great deal of uh, love and work that goes into our, our platform and legislative priorities and, and it's an exciting time. So thank you, Cassie, for giving me a, a moment to talk about legislative priorities. And I look forward to seeing everybody uh, at the convention next week. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for what you do and for being here tonight. Um, the next committee we're going to talk about is credentials. And is Susan on uh, the Zoom with us tonight? Wasn't sure. Here. She... I'm here. Oh, I'm on great. the phone. I'm sorry. Ah, there you are. Okay, great. Let me pin you. Okay, you ready? There you go. Uh, okay, thank you. Your all thumb is covering here. the video. I'm, I'm excuse me. The, you're, you have uh, something pink or flesh colored covering your video? I don't, works. I think it's your, your I think it's your uh, screen, your. There you go. But I, you, can, you can talk without, I can talk without being seen. 
You can, but now we can see your lovely face. So go take it away. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You can see me to now? Yes, we can. Yes, I'm on a phone, so I'm having a little bit of hard time keeping up. But much of the work that the Credentials Committee does is done by the RPT because they they uh, square together the uh, delegates lists that are, are submitted by the uh, convention, uh, senatorial and county conventions. And uh, there's lots of del uh, lists are submitted to the uh, RPT staff, and then they communicate about the registration for the committee. And there were 228 county district conventions. So that's a lot of people. We have a possibility of 700, 7,855 delegates and 1,721 7, alternate delegates. So that's a lot of people coming together in one room when we get into the uh, general sessions. Individually, we work on resolving challenges before uh, they that are sent back to us, like a name is spelled wrong on the list or a nickname has been used instead of an in, in a given name that is uh, registered to vote. So uh, we resolved those issues. I have to say 16 didn't have any uh, issues to resolve. So I don't really know what some of the issues were, but they've all been resolved. So then we come together as a whole uh, to hear challenges that other individuals make, make against the Delta a delegate believing that they're not Republicans or they didn't vote or uh, that kind of thing. And then we also uh, try to resolve issues that any rules that might have been violated. And the one rule that I can think of that was violated in the past was that names were added to the list after the convention uh, adjourned. And that is absolutely uh, against the party rules that you cannot add names or recruit people after the convention, your senatorial or county convention has resolved or been re, uh, been adjourned. So I know that that happened a few years ago and it took a long time to get that resolved. But uh, as of right now, you have 10 days before the convention to a large, uh, 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 lodge a, a challenge. And as far as I know, no challenges have been lodged. Uh, if, if a challenge had been, lo been lodged against uh, an individual, uh, or district, then it would first go before the SREC. And if they thought it was uh, founded of a proper uh, challenge, then they would have, uh, they would uh, provide it to us if, uh, as a committee of the whole. So both sides would be present and we would listen. But as of right now, there have been no challenges lodged that I know of. And uh, the committee has not received any challenges. Our first meeting will be um, on uh, the 15th, that's Wednesday at 11 and we'll be at the convention center. And then we will have another meeting uh, just before the final registration report is given at the first clock at general uh, 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 session of the convention. So we are all temporary members as been said, said before. And so the first caucus that we go to uh, the committees will be made uh, permanent. So you may change members and you, or you may not. And uh, with that, I think Cassie, I have covered everything that is credentials. I would say if you're only going to uh, pick a committee to go to, credentials would not be the one to come to because <laughs> we don't really have uh, anything to really discuss, but it's always, it's always fun to go see the, um, platform and resolutions and rules committees, because there's always a lot of action going on in those rooms, a lot of hovering and uh, caucusing individually. So uh, have fun at the convention. It's so fun. I've been going since 1980, and I don't know that I've missed any in, since uh, all those years. And with that, Cassie, thank you for doing this for us. You always do excellent work, and we appreciate all that you do for RPT, TFRW, the state of Texas, and now CHIP. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Um, said on the, the training I did last time, it's like, 
Yeah, credentials is not the sexy committee, but it's a very vital committee because it's making sure that the people who are elected to be there um, are there and get their, get seated with their credentials. Um, so it's kind of, in a little bit, it's sort of like an election integrity committee for the folks who were elected. So um, thank you for being there. Um, next up, uh, we have party, organi party organization, temporary organization is uh, Barbie on. Yes. Sorry. Oh, there you are. Okay. Sorry. I apologize. Tech, tech difficulties. Uh, so Cassie, it's so good to see you uh, and Tony Ann and Kit and everybody. Uh, you want to talk about a sexy committee. <laughs> <laughs> so that would not be the organizational committee either. Uh, although very, um, uh, it is it is a formality and it needs to be done. But um, so I'm Barbie Baker. I'm in Corpus Christi, Texas, Nueces County. And for the organizational committee, uh, Deborah Kelting Fit is the uh, committee chairwoman for that committee. She is SREC and SD7. Um, the organization committee meets at 11 a.m. on Wednesday, June 15th. That will be in room 310A. The organization committee, uh, quite honestly, from everything I've seen over uh, all the conventions that I've been to and, and participating, the organization committee is the easy one. So they knew what they were doing by, by sticking me on that easy committee. But the, um, the, the, the organizational committee is charged with uh, basically recommending the temporary and permanent organizational officers for the state convention. And so we, um, there are the chair uh, recommendations from SREC are uh, for the RPT convention, the chairman, uh, Matt Rinaldi, secretary, uh, Virgil Cruz, and the sergeant at arms is Mike Robertson. Uh, each of them have been asked, uh, each of the nominees is willing to serve in their respective capacity, and each nominee is currently functionally serving in those capacities. So uh, basically what we'll do is we'll get together and we'll say, yep, 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 and then our committee chair will, uh, will report to SREC and to the convention body and then, uh, and then our job's done. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And for each of you that are on this uh, training session, and this is your, your first convention, um, this is the very first time I am serving on a committee for the convention, um, but I highly agree with what was stated you know, if you want to get involved and you want to understand each of these committees to a higher uh, capacity, 100 um, percent, get to know your SREC members and um, and just do what you can. So each year your your availability will be different. So I look forward to seeing everyone. Uh, God bless. And thank you, ladies, again for putting this on. Thank you, Barbie, and thank you for, for serving there. Um, the next up, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this committee later, but is state nominations. There is no temporary committee for it. There's only a permanent committee. And um, you're going to elect that person in your first Senate District Caucus. Um, and they actually are kind of, kind of like the Electoral College. They sort of carry your vote from your Senate District for chairman and vice chairman to, to the larger committee of the other 31, uh, or the other 30 Senate Districts. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, convention advocacy, and several of these ladies already touched on it. Um, you can sign up to testify. Um, each, each one of the individual committees, um, main three would be platform rules and legislative priorities would have testimony. Um, you can sign up to testify and they will put forward, um, if it's not already on texasgop.org, they will put the information out about when they'll be taking testimony and how they want you to sign up for it. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think they're taking virtual testimony. I think you do have to be there in person. Um, but I would encourage you to be succinct and courteous. 
Um, but also if you want to be successful, you need to communicate effectively. So, um, you're probably very passionate about whatever it is that you're talking about. And you're probably a bit of an expert, but if you give them 500 pages to read in three days, your issue is going to be bottom of the pile because they can't possibly comprehend, um, all that information in such a short period of time. So, um, you know, be succinct, hit the high points, give them a, uh, you know, short video or something that they can access. Um, Debbie had the great example of both bringing a couple of hard copies and, and having that information electronically available. So they could copy and paste something if there was wording or information that they wanted to use. So I highly recommend that. Um, and then also um, you can contact these folks in advance. Uh, you can find out who's representing your Senate district and reach out to them and let them know. We had a couple people say, uh, one person said, uh, one of the resolutions that was passed out of our Senate district, I wrote the wording in like 45 seconds. How can I um, you know, update the wording a little bit on that? Well, this is your opportunity. Contact your, um, your Senate district representative or you can contact the entire committee and say, this is an issue or a plank or whatever it is that you'd like to have included or addressed. And um, I would also say if somebody had a question about, are they serving on this committee? Um, because they served on like, for example, the platform committee at their county or Senate district level. Well, with every, every convention, if you have a role in that convention, it ends when that convention adjourns. So if you are on the platform committee for your county or Senate district convention, first of all, thank you for your service, but that does not mean that you're on automatically uh, a member of the state uh, committee that's for state convention. Um, so just to clarify that, um, somebody asked about the live stream link. We don't know exactly where that will be posted. I know in past um, they did it through um, that's weird. Uh, in the past, they did it through, um, YouTube. Uh, but I'm sure I'm assuming that they will post it, uh, very clearly on the website, uh, where all the other convention information is. If you want the contact information for those uh, committee members, that is also on the website. And I do suggest you, you visit with them in person. Um, I've had folks that call after the temporary committee has already finished their work and they gripe out the temporary committee member because they didn't push forward a certain issue or a certain plank or a certain rule. And they said, well, I didn't, I didn't know that you wanted me to advocate for that, right? So um, you have to think of your constituent for the person representing you. And so you have to reach out and let them know uh, what you want. Before we go on, several people asked, is there like an example of how the party is structured? And I, I stopped sharing my screen earlier so I could pull that up for you. Um, so I'm gonna change uh, really quickly PowerPoint here. So I, I jokingly say, um, my parents are really excited about this particular, um, oops, sorry, about this particular uh, graphic because I saw it in college when I was going to school. So my college education was worth something. Um, so this is an example of how the party is structured. Um, and the convention uh, side on the far right there, ironically on the far right, um, <laughs> it shows the convention process. So you can see, you know, you have your, your precinct chair and your precinct convention, as well as like your local leaders. And it shows that the grassroots down here is the base of that. So um, the more local it is, the more weight your vote has, the more impact you have. Um, and it shows this process. So I just wanted to put this graphic up here really quick. Um, so people had a chance to understand kind of where things line up um, for state, local, and federal structure. So, okay, on back to uh, the convention. So, hmm, my screen, oh, got it. Sorry, technology. This is fun. Okay, whoops. Mm -mm -mm. Apologies. Let's go back here and screen share. Okay, we're, we're back. Okay, so we're going to talk about voting. Okay. Um, so there's a couple types of voting. There's a voice vote. All in favor say aye. All opposed say nay. Right. 
that's that's probably the most most common um and most of the time you can get a pretty good answer that most people are very in favor or very opposed to a measure at hand um the chair will call you know uh, in the opinion of the chair the eyes have it right um and so if you don't like that you could ask for a division vote and what that means is um we're gonna we're gonna stand up and we're like gonna count heads kind of a thing and then the other side you know i brace it down and then the other side stands up you know if you're against stand up you count those heads and then you then then the uh, chair gives their opinion of how the vote went um if you still think that there's there's something about that that uh isn't quite up to snuff then you can have a roll call vote uh and that takes a whole lot of time <laughs> um because there's a lot of process to it but it's essentially also how we're going to vote for any contested race either in our senate district caucus or on the floor of the convention okay so um any race that happens, let's say there are, well, we know that there is more than one candidate running for vice chair, right? So um, when those candidates, uh, someone will open the floor for nominate, the chair will open the floor for nominations, uh, a delegate will nominate a candidate, there will be a second. And then um, once we have all the nominations, uh, nominations will close. The, the three candidates or their representative or however many candidates there are will draw lots for speaking order. They will each get to speak and uh, then they we will pass out ballots. And that way that'll go is the delegation lead for your county or your area, if you're a Senate district that's entirely within one county, um, will figure out they'll seat all of their alternates as delegates. If there's any delegate slots that are not filled with delegates, and then they'll let the, the caucus chair know, like uh, Williamson County uh, has a strength of 110 delegates and we have 108 uh, voting, right? Or whatever the numbers end up being. And so they'll count out 108 little slips of paper to Williamson County. Williamson County will pass those out to all of their delegates. Everybody will vote how they're gonna vote. Williamson County will take up all of their pieces of paper, making sure they have 108 then they will, because that's how many delegates they had seated in voting at that time. They will take it forward to the caucus chair and the teller with their votes. The teller committee, which is basically like um, the, the, the committee that's counting out the votes, dividing them up and counting them to verify how many ballots they have and then how many votes for each candidate. Uh, and then they'll put them in a weighted spreadsheet. And I'll talk about the weighted spreadsheet in a second. That's how the election will go. Now, um, we vote by strength in a Senate district caucus. So everything we're doing at this convention is a strength vote. We vote in our Senate districts by strength. How is that determined? It's determined by how many Republicans voted for the Republican uh, nominee for governor in the last gubernatorial general election. So that's a lot of gobbledygook to say the places that turn out more Republican votes for the Republican governor get more weight with their vote at the state convention. If you think about it, it's kind of like the difference between the United States Senate and the United States Congress. Um, every county in Texas, regardless of how many Republican votes they have, they get two delegates and two alternates. Um, but then the other areas get more delegate slots because they have a hard, a larger Republican voting presence. Okay. And the idea behind that is if that particular county has more Republicans, but they're just really far away, like when I grew up back in Amarillo, um, sometimes that's a bit of a trick to get down to Houston and your flight has to leave early or it came late or something in between. And so we still want that county to have the same weight of votes. Um, so that being said, I'm sure that's clear as mud to you. Um, <laughs> but the idea is if there were 10 slots and two people voting and one was in favor and one was against, each person's vote would have the weight of, of five, right? And there's, there's a little spreadsheet that helps calculate that. Uh, when you do vote, uh, unless you're voting for a name of a person, your options are really yes, no, or present not voting. And this is an example. I'm not going to read it to you. I'm just going to talk a little bit and you can read it if you want. Um, if you vote present not voting, sometimes that can count against a measure passing. 
Um, so just be mindful of that if you are casting a ballot. Um, somebody did ask, um, how do I, how do I weigh my vote in the sense of, um, is it my personal opinion or am I representing other people? And I would say that's really up to you. You could consider that your vote represents the county that sent you forward to the state convention, or it's your personal vote. Um, however, you think that is, uh, works for you. Um, I'm looking at the questions just to see what we have here. Um, if you haven't, one of them is registration, which remind you again, everything is at texasgop.org, T-E-X-A-S-G-O-P.org. So, okay, next up, seating arrangements. Who knew you were going to have to talk about where to sit, right? <laughs> um, for delegates, it's really simple. Uh, on the general session, you're going to sit by your Senate districts and they have these huge signs on these poles. And so you'll sit with your Senate district. And as a reminder, that's the Senate district that you voted in in this last primary, the one that's on your voter registration card. Um, and then if you have multiple counties in your Senate district, your, your Senate district caucus chair will have, hopefully, likely, uh, have seating there so that the, the counties can sit together. So if we do have a vote on the floor, you don't have to scrabble and have four or five or 15 different people sitting all over, you know, those 75 chairs in that Senate district or whatnot. Um, and then in caucus, you'll also want to sit by county for the same reason. It helps uh, ease the, the uh, voting process. Um, oh, one thing I did forget to talk about uh, earlier, the platform uh, will, well, actually, I'm going to talk about that later. Sorry about that. Uh, alternates will sit in alternate and guest seating unless they're being seated in the place of a delegate slot. If you're an alternate that is seated for the entire convention or even a part of the convention uh, as a delegate, the only time that you're sitting with the delegates is when you're serving as in the role of a delegate. So if somebody isn't coming because their Aunt Sue uh, broke their hip and they're you know, helping to nurse them back to health, and that slot's open the entire time. An alternate could be seated for a delegate for the entire convention. Um, or it could be that, you know, Bobby Joe had to run to the bathroom and is about to miss a vote. And so an alternate is seated a as a delegate for just that vote. Um, the method of placing alternates as delegates was determined by your county or Senate district convention. Okay, so sometimes that means the first um, delegate slot that opens, alternate number one is seated, and then they just kind of roll down the list. Um, sometimes they decide to pair people. That being like at the national convention, that's what we do. Delegate one is paired with alternate one. And so the only time alternate one is seated is if delegate one is not there. Um, so that's determined by uh, your previous convention. So either your county chair, or your delegation lead, um, pardon me, should have that information and be able to share that with you. I have a question there. Uh, so somebody said, and this is the example, they have eight counties in their Senate district. Uh, how will we be seated in our Senate district? Uh, my recommendation would be that you sit by county so that if a vote comes up, it's very easy for that county chair or that delegation lead, whoever's in that role, to see, oh, there's 10 seats here and only seven of them are filled. So we have three openings for delegates. Do we have any alternates that need to be seated, right? They would seat them before the vote takes place. Um, that, that's the concept. So that's why I recommend that, they, that you sit with your um your county so it's really easy for them to count heads and determine how many people need to be seated because think about this there's 254 counties some of those counties have multiple senate districts so that's around like 270 potential counties or delegations that have to seat alternates as delegates and if we're doing that on the floor before a vote that is extremely time consuming so we're trying to be as efficient and organized as possible so hope that answers your question okay 
Um, so general sessions, there's kind of two types of meetings that we're in. We're in general session and that's all the delegates, alternates, guests, whatever, that's the big stage. Uh, and then we have Senate district caucuses, which are just the other delegates in your Senate district. So first talking about general sessions. The very first one is 10 a.m. on Thursday. Um, if you're getting there Thursday, don't expect to pick up your credentials 10 minutes before the general session starts, okay? Because that's what everybody else is planning to do. <laughs> um, you know, if you're, if you're going to be spending Wednesday night uh, and it's easy for you to go over to the convention center to pick up your credentials on Wednesday afternoon, I would highly recommend that you do that. Um, if not, then just pick them up when you get there. Everybody's got, you know, their own, their own uh, schedule and obligations. So um, there's going to be a similar pattern. We're going to have the opening ceremony. There'll be a call to order. Um, and then we'll have the temporary committee reports. And that first uh, committee report will be uh, recommending the permanent officers for the convention from the organization committee. So each committee will come up and kind of tell you the work that they've done and where they're at. Uh, and then we'll have remarks for the candidates running for state chair and state vice chair. And then there'll be other uh, elected officials and whatnot speaking. I don't have the exact schedule of who those individuals are, but that's the gist of what happens in the first general session, okay? The next general session is the following morning at 10 a.m. And that is where we will hear from the permanent credentials committee. They'll come up and say, there's a strength of, so many thousand, 7,000, whatever, uh, didn't, didn't catch the number. Uh, and you know, 4,552 are present, right? Um, so we'll get that report and we'll get that report at the start of each general session in the morning. Um, the third general session, Friday uh, at 1.30, we're gonna have the report from the state nominations committee. Because there's more than one person running for vice, more than two people running for vice chair, there is very likely a possibility that we could have a floor vote for vice chair. We'll go over that in a little bit. Um, but that means that that's going to be a vote and you'll want to be present for that uh, if there is a vote. And we won't know until about 1.30 on Friday. <laughs> um, and then, then after we have our, we have elected our state chair and vice chair for the next two years, um, we will have the permanent rules committee. So they will put forward uh, the document of, of the rules and they'll let us kind of, they'll let us know kind of a highlight. Here's what we changed. Here's what we added. Here's what we took out. And then the um, whole convention will begin debate on the rules. Um, overall, you're either going to pass it or you're not going to pass it. And then if people want to add or take out or insert or whatever, then they can do that along the way. Uh, but at the end of the day, you either pass it, you vote for the rules, or you vote against the rules, however they stand at that time in the convention, okay? We'll talk a little bit more about parliamentary procedure at the end, which is how that um, situation could change based on what motions and whatnot are put forward. Um, the fourth general session is Saturday morning, and this is where we'll start the platform committee. Um, in the last... Mm, four conventions or so, uh, I don't have the exact number. We've done something called plank by plank voting. And what that was is every single plank on the platform, a delegate would get a Scantron and they would vote yes or no on every single plank. Well, we've been doing that for a number of conventions and we have yet to remove a plank from the platform. So, you know, we got to take that feedback uh, that's obviously not working as it was designed. The, the intent was if the whole body doesn't agree on this plank, if 50% plus one don't like a plank, it won't be included. Um, but even then we have passed planks that are incomplete or contradictory uh, or have all kinds of crazy misspellings or things like that. So um, this year uh, it's gonna have a tremendous cost if we try to do that. And since it's not producing results, uh, we're going to go back to the old format, which is basically it will be presented, uh, it will be debated, and then we pass it or we don't pass it, you know, just like the rules. So uh, let me check the chat here. I think we have some questions. Uh, somebody said, uh, is there a schedule? Yes, the schedule is on the RPT website, texasgop.org. Click the convention tab. Um, all the times and the schedule is there. 
Um, <laughs> how long does the general session last? Um, for the most part, I'll refer you back to the schedule. Uh, there's usually, we usually are stopping at a time certain because there's an event. Um, like on, um, on Thursday, there's a lunch that's happening on, um, Friday night, there's the RPT gala, right? So like we have to stop so people can, uh, go get dressed and they have time to set up and, and people can go have dinner at the gala. So, um, those are all, those all times are all listed. Um, and they're on the website, texasgop.org. Uh, so somebody said, if we get our credentials um, and enter the convention at 1015 on Thursday, we'll be able to participate in the first general session. Um, I would just plan to be early because think about this. There's 7,000 delegates potentially there, which also means there potentially could be 7,000 alternates plus any other guests that come. Uh, so that's a lot of people to move around. Um, I, I would add a little extra time so that you're always early and you get a, you get get a good seat and you're in your seat and ready to go um, for whatever's coming up. Let's see. Um, okay, uh, Stacy, I'll get to your question in a second. Um, Peter uh, asked, he said, I thought the plank by plank voting was based on the rules we approve and know that that's, that's not accurate. Um, but the plank by plank voting, like I said, it, it hasn't produced a result that was, um, intended. And so they're, they're going to, we're going to be fiscally responsible and not spend thousands and thousands of dollars, um, to just pass something that's all going to pass. Right. Um, if other people have creative ways to go about that, I don't. I think it's too late for this convention because of logistics. But uh, reach out to the state party and let them know. Um, ah, okay. Um, There's a couple of questions on there that are super detailed. And um, I'm, if I'm not answering your question, feel free to email me. My contact information will be at the end and I will be happy to answer, uh, but we're trying to streamline things here. So moving on. So those, uh, we, are, we have one more general session, sorry, the fifth general session, uh, which is on Saturday, Saturday afternoon after the congressional lunch. And that is the uh, continued debate on the platform if needed and the legislative priorities committee will give their report. And um, that vote will be taken on a Scantron, but that Scantron is gonna have to be hand tallied. And so that's why it's the, kind of the last thing on the agenda. So they have the time to uh, go through and, and tally that and then send out the results of the um, top um, items that receive the most votes. So those will be the legislative priorities for the next two years that the party will pursue. So, uh, oops. I don't think you need credentials to attend the parliamentary procedure training, uh, but then my recommendation would be pick them up on Wednesday. Um, if you purchase tickets, tickets should be with your credentials when you, uh, when you pick up your credentials at your little Senate district kiosk. Okay, so now we're on to Senate district caucuses, okay, SD caucuses. And these are the people that are in your Senate district um, that you voted in in this last primary. So for example, right now, my current Senator is Charles Swartner from SD5 until January 1, when the new Senator for SD24 is sworn into office, right? But I'm caucusing with Senate District 24 because that's the election I voted in this primary, right? So, um, the first Senate District Caucus is going to be Thursday at 1 p.m. And this is where you're going to elect your permanent caucus chair and your permanent committee members. And then your second district caucus will be on Friday at 8 a.m., nice, bright, and early. And that's where you, you will elect your SREC man and woman and your chair and vice chair candidates. So to go a little more in depth on that, this is what it'll look like, okay? You're in your seat, we call the meeting to order, we pray, we pledge, we sing. Uh, we have the appointment of the temporary officers by the temporary chair. 
Uh, and then we have the roll call establishing the voting body. So every every county would say we have X number of people uh, current, currently seated and, and ready to vote, right? And then if there's any slots where delegates aren't present and there are alternates that can be seated, those alternates will be seated. Then after that, once we know how many votes we have, we'll go on to elect the permanent chair and then the chair will appoint the permanent officers. 99.99999% of the time, whoever your temporary people are for your caucus chair, your caucus officers, your uh, temporary committee members are the people that are elected to serve on the permanent committee. Um, and, and I think there is some wisdom to that uh, because they have been working and planning and received training in the case of the caucus chair on how to conduct the business of the caucus. Uh, for the committee members, they've already established rapport and relationships with the other 30 people um, representing the other Senate districts and know what issues have come before. They were there for all the testimony, you know, um, but it's your vote. And so you get to do with it what you feel is the right thing to do. Um, we will, after you have your officers in place, you do your committee members. And um, again, we went over the voting. There's open nominations. If there's more than one person, they'll draw for speaking order. They'll speak and then they'll vote. Um, once we elect those positions, uh, and as they're elected, they'll go, they, they may need to go off and start participating uh, as your representative, just depending on timing. And then we have announcements and we adjourn that caucus meeting. Okay, let's see. We have some questions. Okay, they're not pertaining to this. So moving on. Um, your second Senate District Caucus. The top part should look familiar. You're going to have call the meeting to order. We'll pray, we'll pledge, we'll sing. I'm putting sing in there because I like to sing. Uh, the national anthem and Texas are Texas because I'm trying to start that trend. Because um, most people don't know Texas are Texas and dang it, that's our state song and they ought to. Um, so anyway, then you have your roll call and uh, establish the voting body, seat delegates, seat alternates as delegates if there's vacancies. Um, technically, you're supposed to read the minutes from the previous caucus. Pro tip, be the person who says, I move we suspend the reading of the minutes. <laughs> and that'll save a little bit of time. Um, and then uh, you'll have your uh, nominations for state party officer um, and you'll take those. We do the vote like we've been doing voting. Um, then we'll do the SREC media members, the state Republican executive committee. Now state law dictates that uh, if the state vice chair is a woman, then, the, then uh, excuse me, if the chair is a woman, then the vice chair has to be a man. Conversely, like we have right now, Matt Rinaldi is the state chairman. He's a man. So the vice chair has to be a woman. That's Cat Parks, right? Um, state law also requires that each SREC district, each SREC member has a man and a woman for that Senate district. Um, so uh, you'll, have, you'll have one of each. So that's, that's how that's selected. So state chair and vice chair elections. Um, for a chair and vice chair, there's paperwork that has to be filed prior to the convention to let people know that you're running. Um, they have to be nominated by a delegate in the Senate district to receive a nomination, a second, excuse me. Uh, and then um, that your state nominations person basically carries your vote from your Senate district to the state nominations committee. Uh, now, um, there, there's some issues here, right? Because we have, uh, right now we have at least three declared candidates that are actually running for the office. I've heard rumors of potentially more, but at least three. Um, they have to have a vote from 16 Senate districts to be elected. Um, each Senate district state nominations committee member has to carry the vote of the Senate district on the first vote. For example, um, Let's see if um, Tweety Bird and Elmer Fudd and uh, who's the third one? I don't know. Yogi Bear are all three candidates, right? Um, and one of them gets 16 votes and it's very clearly that's that's half, right? Um, but whatever, whatever you voted in your Senate district, that person has to carry that vote. So let's say Yogi Bear, only one Senate district liked Yogi Bear. Well, on the first ballot, they have to vote for Yogi Bear. They recognize that the other Senate districts aren't going for that. So if we didn't have the opportunity for them to vote differently on the second round of balloting, we just keep getting the same result, right? That's not productive. 
So um, I don't know who, how, whoever's writing on there is writing on there, but that's interesting. Um, <laughs> Um, anyway, so on the second round of voting or third or fourth or how many it takes, um, that state nominations person can change their vote, uh, based, you know, on their recommendation or on the recommendation of what their Senate district has charged them to do. Um, if a candidate receives at least three Senate district support, um, then they can be nominated from the floor. The other option is if there is a written petition of 20% of the delegates, that request a candidate be nominated from the floor. Um, so that's uh, just something to keep in mind. Oh, before I go on, uh, there is a vice chair candidate Zoom that our wonderful committee woman, Tony Ann DeShiel, is putting on uh, Friday at 10, uh, 7 a.m. on the 10th, excuse me, but Friday, June 10th at 7 a.m. Uh, she has sent out multiple emails about it. I believe TFRW has sent out an email about it. Um, Tony Ann, if you're on, could you let people know where they could go to register that if they're interested? Well, thank you, uh, Cassie. Yes, they could go to uh, TonyAnnDeShield.com. But everybody on this phone, on this call should have gotten at least one email to be able to register. So right now we have almost 600 people signed up to uh, participate on Friday morning. I know it's hard to believe, 7 a.m., but they show up. And we will have a very fair and balanced uh, forum with the three uh, ladies and will last uh, one hour. So there'll be, um, so I welcome you to join in. Again, you can go to TonyAnnDeShield.com or you can look for the email. You might need to go into your junk file, look for my email, either Tad Talks or from TFRW or the delegates and join us. Okay. Thank you, Cassie. Oh, she left. Um, so, okay, you're coming back. Yes. I was trying to be quick, Cassie. I know. Well, my dog's been trying to go out for a while. <laughs> oh, that that is so, fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, she's going to start to get very vocal and that would be distracting to the call. So um, I will say a lot of people don't really understand what the role of the chair and vice chair is. And uh, you know, my particular opinion is that they get Republicans elected and they get more people to vote Republican. Um, and I know that sounds really basic, but, um, you know, working with, with the grassroots and uh, supporting with resources and finances and fundraising, um, you know, that, that's kind of the role. Um, working with the SREC, the county chairs and the other Republican groups around the state uh, to get people elected and get policies passed. So we have a couple of questions. Let me see really quick. Okay, great. Nothing for this. So uh, SRAC member election. Um, there is no paperwork that's required to file. Um, somebody asked earlier, how do we know who's running to be on the SRAC? And honestly, if they're running, they should have contacted you by now. <laughs> um, they should be campaigning for your vote, whether that's a phone call, an email, a text message, uh, something in the in the snail mail. Um, there's a lady running, uh, I'll just say, Mary Jane is running uh, for SD24 to get reelected. And uh, somebody, uh, I don't remember the name of the person, hand wrote a note to me as a delegate asking me to support her with my vote. Um, and I'll be honest, that went a long way because there was somebody else, not that candidate, who took the time to write me, to write me a note uh, just advocating for uh, Mary Jane and, and all that she's doing to get her reelected. Um, so theoretically, they will tell you in advance that they're running. Uh, some people you may not know until you get to convention if you're not plugged into like a Republican Women's Club or uh, super active with any other you know, Republican activities in your county, or if your county's sort of new in, in the Republican field and don't have that infrastructure, uh, then you, you may not know until you get there. But I would suggest you don't just stand up and be like, heck yeah, I want to be on the SREC and nominate yourself. I mean, you can do that. Uh, but I would think that that person might not be quite as informed uh, to be ready to, to step into the role. So um, just as a note, you can nominate yourself for, for any of these positions that we've talked about in voting, uh, but you do have to get a second at least. So make sure you have somebody at least second you um, <laughs> before you put your name in that. Um, but each nominee has the opportunity to speak. Um, they can speak or people can speak on their behalf. And that's 
follows the same way for other positions that are contested. There'll be a limited number amount of time for them to speak. And, um, you know, you can have others speak on your behalf for like the vice chair candidates. I mean, there's 31 Senate districts. It's not likely all three candidates are going to go to all 31 Senate districts. They're probably going to have somebody identified to speak on their behalf. So, um, and at the first Senate district caucus, there might be information out there about candidates like their resume or telling you what their plan is to serve if elected. Um, and just know that if you are elected, there is an organizational meeting for those members at the uh, close of the convention. And it's very important to be there because there's some elections that take place and things like that. So uh, make sure if you are elected that you attend that organizational meeting. Um, okay, next up. Uh, oh, I was gonna say this about the SRC. Um, I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the, the chair and vice chair is supposed to help. I sort of see the SREC as kind of like the fertilizer. They provide resources, information, training, connection, both from the state party and then concerns, issues, uh, successes from the county parties and, and uh, clubs and things like that back to the state level. Um, so the, the least important thing, in my opinion, and, and I worked at the party for five and a half years, that an SREC member can do is show up at the quarterly meetings and vote. That is the least effective thing that they can do. It's still important, but the most important thing they can do is to be active and communicating with the county chairs and the clubs and whatnot in their district to get more Republicans elected. So um, other events at convention, there's all kinds of fun stuff, including some events by TFRW. Uh, Jill Tate, are you on the line? I am on the line and I'd like to make an exciting announcement about the champion of freedom. Hit us. I can. I have just confirmed today that Senator Ted Cruz will also be joining us at the champion of freedom lunch to help us honor Senator Nelson. So we definitely want to have all of our members there. We're running out of tickets. So please go on to the the easiest thing to do is go on to the TFRW website and go under events to Champion of Freedom and hit RSVP and I'll take you to um, our ticket website. We're going to be honoring Senator Nelson with the Champion of Freedom Award as she ends her 30 years of service to um, our great state. And so uh, Lieutenant Governor and Senator Cruz will be there to help us uh, celebrate her and we would love to have all of our TFRW members there. And Jill. Jill, do you have to be a member of TFRW to buy a ticket and support? Absolutely not. Anybody can come. And if you're there with a cousin, you're there with your husband, you're there with whoever, everybody is welcome to attend. It will be at the Hilton Americas, which is right next door to the convention center. And there's a nice air-conditioned walkway to the uh, the to the uh, luncheon in the second floor ballroom goes directly over there, so you don't even have to get out and get hot. Um, yeah, I will say um, Senator Nelson is the like the highest ranking woman in the Texas Senate as far as committee chairmanship. She's been on the finance committee, um, and I think she's the first Republican woman woman ever to hold that position in the Texas Senate. Um, so really, really impressive woman, and we are so appreciative of her service. Uh, she was a mom who got ticked off and decided to run for office, and the state has been a huge um, beneficiary of her years of service. So uh, really encourage you to go to that. It's fun. Um, you can sit with your club if you uh, put that in the notes, or the best thing to do would be to buy tickets together in one batch though, right, Jill? Like if you, Yes, you or be sure that you include, if you're not currently an active member, um, I'm going to sit everybody by clubs. So if there's a particular club you want to sit with, where it says what club you're a member of, pick which club it is so I know where to sit you. Um, and I'll type my email address in the chat so that um, if you need further info, um, you can email me and I will also put the link over here in the, in the chat as well to buy tickets. How's that? Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. And I'll say, if you're not a member, then somebody at that table will get you to join. So, um, <laughs> even if you're not, even if you're a man, you can be a member of TFRW as an associate. So we appreciate your support. Um, the other TFRW event that's happening is the TFRW patron event, uh, with, um, Lieutenant Governor Winsome Sears. I'm super excited about that event. 
Uh, if you are not a TFRW patron, you do have to sign up to be a patron to attend that event. You can find information about that, tfrw.org. Um, if you are a patron, you still need to RSVP. So um, even if you're a patron and plan to go, make sure you RSVP. And I believe that information was in the newsletter this last month as well. So um, other events happening, this is all on the schedule, texasgop.org. Um, if you're a sergeant at arms, you need to make sure you're at that training. Uh, parliamentary procedure never hurts to go over it. There's some new things coming this time. They're, ha uh, they're having these movies that you can go see. One is 2000 Mules. They're offering it, I think, three times. And then there's some other kind of short documentary type, type movies that are happening uh, that are just other options for you to get something out of convention. Um, they are having the Grassroots Club event if you're a Grassroots Club member through the state party. And then the big welcome event uh, at 530 at the Rustic hosted by the governor. This is the welcome reception to convention. Uh, governor and Mrs. Abbott will be there. Um, I was on a call last night and they were really, they were really hyping it up. They didn't say there was kind of seemed like there was going to be another special guest. I don't know who that is, but I'm interested to go see. Um, it's free food, live entertainment, but you do need to RSVP. Um, you should have received a text message or an email about that. Some people have had some issues RSVPing on Eventbrite. Um, just reach out to somebody else you know who's going. Uh, like, for example, my dad, who's a county chair, had issues RSVPing for his ticket. So when I registered for my husband and myself, I just got another ticket. Uh, it's free to go, but just want to register so we know who's going to be there. They don't run out of food, right? Um, other events happening on Friday, um, of course, the TFRW Champion of Freedom Lunch. And then there are some other opportunities called Lunch and Learns. Um, just a note, as I mentioned earlier, does not include lunch. It's just happening during lunch. Um, so just be aware of that. Don't, don't expect a ham sandwich or anything. Um, it's just an opportunity to, to learn on some of these topics. Um, and then that evening, Cassie, there's the game. Yes. Cassie, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I have to add this because this just got onto the, web, um, the schedule. There will be uh, election integrity, poll watching, uh, so, so Melissa Conway is having a lunch and learn. Please look at the schedule. If that's one thing that you really want to participate in, she is having it on both Friday and Saturday. And I'm sorry to interrupt, but I thought that was no. important. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I, I got this information two days ago. So see, they're still adding some things. So check back t, uh, texasgop.org for that updated convention schedule. And Cassie, um, can you just add yeah. one quick other thing, just so that everybody knows, this stuff is not going on during general sessions or during your caucus, so you're not going to miss out on anything. So if you sign up for the TFRW lunch, yeah, for the Champion of Freedom lunch, it's at the end of a general session, and well, there'll be no, you're not going to miss anything. So don't worry about that. I think some people get concerned about missing out if they go to a lunch and learn or any of the events. You'll now you'll never miss a caucus or a general session. That's exactly right. Like these are all fun things and informative things to do, but um, the purpose of the convention is those general sessions that caucus. So this is just kind of supplemental things happening outside of that, sometimes because committee meetings, temporary committee or permanent committee meetings are going on. And so it's just kind of something to, to fill in the time for those other delegates and, and guests and whatnot that are there at the convention. Um, and then Saturday, uh, just another schedule of events. And again, uh, as Tony Ann said, there, there's uh, at least one other uh, lunch and learn that was been added for Saturday. So uh, take a look at that schedule and figure out what you want to do. And of course, there's always the exhibitors. Um, there's groups, uh, you know, TFRW has a booth there. So if you're not a member and you're on this call and you want to join, go check them out. I think we're also uh, have uh, all kinds of uh, goodies to buy there. Um, candidates and elected officials usually have um, booths and sometimes they have some cool giveaways um, like Dr. Donna Campbell. Uh, should have had my fan ready to whip out because I'm a fan of Dr. Donna Campbell and she has those little fans and in Houston, you're going to want a fan. Um, <laughs> but um, TLR, if they have a booth, they always have cool giveaways. Um, and so that's neat. But um, those groups, those candidates, those elected officials, that could be folks to come speak at your club or your county. Um, so it's a great opportunity to, to learn about them. Um, there could be book signings and there's lots and lots of shopping, uh, including my favorite, the Packet Arms Trunk. Um, 
That's my husband's company. Um, so you can, you can, if you don't have any red, white, and blue sparkle to wear at a convention, you can go stock up at the exhibits. And this is the time uh, off to the right there where the exhibits are going to be open. Um, and there, it may be that you just need to get up, stretch your legs for a few minutes. You could pop over there and check out a booth or two, run to the bathroom, and then go back and sit down. Um, so there's, there's lots of opportunities. We have some questions. Let's see. Oh, well, you can get a free shirt at the Senate Republican Caucus booth. Um, I am going to talk about dress, uh, do, 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 do. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about food in a little bit as well. Okay. Um, oh, somebody needs a roommate. So there you go. If <laughs> you still need a roommate. <laughs> um, so next up, we're going to talk about supporting down ballot candidates and I'm going to turn it back over to Jill tape for this one because she is a member of the candidate resource committee hello everybody um i want to talk, tell you all a little bit about the candidate resource committee the committee is specifically to support our down ballot candidates in texas so this is going to be anybody below state rep and these are going to be the seats that directly impact the way you live this is gonna be your county judges, your county commissioners, district clerks, county commissioners, sheriffs, et cetera. Um, and we try to um, are trying to build a bench because these folks that are on a local level and are elected as Republicans, they eventually run for future office. They have run as future state reps, senators, and our state rides. Um, some of our past recipients are Governor Abbott and Senator Cancock, uh, Louis Gomer, Jane Nelson. Um, as, as they came up the ranks, they were all um, candidate resource committee um, recipients. Um, we try to look at areas that are currently Democrat and need a little Republican love um, and try to flip those those counties and those seats into a Republican seat so we can start turning R. Um, we fund the candidates by applying for them. They all, each candidate has to apply for the money. Um, they have to get recommendations from their SREC members. Um, and then we meet uh, usually in August and we uh, vet each one of these candidates, look and see what the, um, what if you know they have a possibility of winning, what they need, look at their, make sure they have a, a good plan, et cetera, and um, then distribute the money throughout the state of Texas. Um, and, and we've had a lot of really good success flipping some uh, local races from a Democrat to Republican. In fact, I can think of one specific race in McLennan County that had been held by a Democrat <laughs> since reconstruction and we moved it to our column. So uh, that is what the resource candidate, the re candidate resource committee is all about. Um, the way we are funded because we don't get funds um, is uh, from the grassroots, from you guys. We will be passing out envelopes. We're gonna be selling our candidate resource pens and we will have um, an auction going on during, con during convention. And um, some of, we'll have some very unique one of a kind items. Uh, we've got like a rocking horse and a rocking chair that were both made in um, uh, at the prison in Huntsville by our prisoners that are absolutely beautiful. They're in my living room. They're gorgeous. Um, we've got a dinner with Matt Rinaldi. We have a dinner with Robin Armstrong. We are working on one with Senator Cruz. Cross our fingers. And um, we've got a one of a kind handmade knife from a Navy SEAL. So um, in TFRW donated a beautiful and hand pen that will be up for sale. So uh, come by our um, booth during convention, bid on the items, and all of the MIDI, all the money, 100% goes to our down ballots, ballot Republican candidates in Texas as we try to flip those, those Democrat seats and hold on to our Republican seats. And if you've been keeping up with what <laughs> has been happening in uh, the, the Valley in South Texas, um, 
there, there was an effort, uh, Cap Parks, along with others, kind of led that effort to recruit Republican candidates to run in those counties that are traditionally uh, heavy, heavy blue counties. And um, we're seeing a lot of folks flip. And so the possibility of $500 or $1,000 to flip a county judge or county commissioner down there, it could be the first Republican official elected in that county. Um, 10 years, well, over 10 years ago, when Steve Ministeri uh, saw the brilliance of uh, making sure we had county chairs in those counties, um, it provided the opportunity to have, in most cases, only the second Republican primary in the history of the state in those counties. And now they have some of those counties have vibrant parties that are running candidates for office, which is exactly what we're supposed to be doing as the party. Um, so that donation could really go a long way. Um, and just an opportunity to get more Republicans elected. So thank you, Jill, for what you do. And where would they find the information for the auction? The auction, um, I believe we're going to try to get an email blast out with the link because the auction will be on uh, online. online. And then at the convention, you'll be able to go by and just zap the QR code and see all the items and everything as well. Great. Um, and, and will you just answer the question was, do they do school board candidates? My understanding is it's uh, partisan races. Is that correct? Yeah, unfortunately, we're partisan races at this time. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, so there will be an opportunity to just, uh, we will not pass the hat because that's not legal, but you'll have an opportunity to put money in an envelope, kind of like old school tithing at church, you know, when we, we had checks and, <laughs> and paper money and we put it in a, an actual envelope uh, to collect the information or that would probably be some QR codes uh, where you could donate electronically. I guarantee you they'll find a way to get your money if you We're want gonna, to. We're going to, yeah, we'll have text to give. We'll have a text to give number that'll go out. That'll also be in the program. It'll be also be on some screens. There'll be QR codes. We will figure out how to get your money. Don't worry. Right. That's right. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, so a couple of people have been asking about dress code and the reason I haven't answered is because I'm about to tell you. Um, the general dress code is comfortable and patriotic. This is Houston in June, okay? Uh, so if you're outside, it's going to be humid, hot, and you're going to get sweaty. So dress accordingly. Um, if you're the type who wants to wear a three-piece suit the entire time, more power to you. Ain't going to be me. Um, <laughs> um, you'll want to take pictures with candidates and things like that as you see them. So just be mindful of that. Pro tip, take off your name tag, your credentials when you do that. So you'll have a really nice photo, um, you know, to, to put on your wall or whatnot. Uh, wear comfortable shoes. I jokingly tell people, bring more than one pair of comfortable shoes. So like your foot can get a blister in a different place each day uh, because there is a lot of walking. Um, if you do need a scooter, if you'll go to texasgop.org, they have the information about the scooter rentals there. I think, it would, I, think I looked the other day and it was about $130 for all three days, uh, but you'll need to make sure to reserve that in advance. Uh, so I encourage you to go on and, and find that. And although it will be hot outside, there are times where it is an absolute freezer inside because they try and cool those rooms down a significant amount before all those warm bodies get in there. So there might be times where you're freezing and you'll wanna have like a light jacket or a scarf or something like that, just in case. So I really oh. encourage you to dress in layers. Um, somebody asked about the dress code for the gala. Um, you can show up in whatever you'd like. Uh, you can wear a ball gown or you can come in your patriotic shorts and flag t-shirt. Uh, I think more probably a Sunday dress or a cocktail dress would be more appropriate. Uh, but, you know, just come as you are. Uh, they're, they're not going to kick you out if you're not wearing a certain thing. So, uh, but I would say something more along, if you have a Reagan dinner or something like that in your county, what you would probably wear to something like that. Um other helpful hints, um, again, comfortable walking shoes. Um, I would even take a couple of band-aids. I have made a lifelong friendship because I had a band-aid at a convention and somebody's like shoe was giving them a blister. Um, I would also encourage you to take your phone accessories, meaning your plug, you know, your wall plug, whoops, oh, there you go. Uh, your your cord for your phone, your charging cord. And I would label those because one little white 
charging block and one little white lightning cord for an iPhone all kind of look the same. Um, so, you know, get a Sharpie marker, write your name on that. Um, and then if you have a backup battery, I would suggest to charge your phone. I would suggest that you bring that as well. Um, when I do my little stand-up comedy routine about conventions, I say, if you want to make friends, you bring a couple of extra cords. Uh, and if you really want to be a power broker, you bring a power strip. <laughs> so, um, there probably will be convention uh, charging stations around the convention, but I can't guarantee that. Um, and they might be busy when you need to use it. So, um, the convention website said you couldn't bring snacks or, you know, like food and water in. Um, what I've seen in the past is a lot of times you can bring like an empty water bottle in and then fill it up, you know, there. Um, and as far as like food or snacks, I would say stick a granola bar or something in your pocket at the very least. Um, most of the time in my experience in political events over the last two decades is sometimes it's cheese whiz on a Ritz cracker with, you know, a bottle of water and that is it. Um, sometimes depending on how involved you want to be with convention, it almost seems like there's not time to eat, right? Because it's also like 10,000 people all trying to eat lunch at the same time. Um, so just be mindful of that and take care of yourself. Um, we don't want anybody to have any type of medical episode because they're not eating or drinking. So uh, make sure you're drinking a lot of water because you will be sweating a lot with all that humidity. Um, and then definitely bring a pen, bring more than one, in fact, because if we have to take a lot of votes and one person has to share a pen down 35 people in their row, that takes a lot more time than if people just have their pen. Um, I would also encourage that you bring um, some sort of bag. Uh, if you don't want to use whatever the convention bag happens to be, um, I would still label it somehow like that luggage tag um, idea or, you know, a bow or something, have your contact information in there somewhere uh, so people can get a hold of you and maybe even a, a backup contact number because like if your phone is in that bag, that doesn't really help people. Um, so, so just to keep that in mind, you'll want to be able to have your convention uh, program with you in the general session and things like that. Um, so maybe think of something that can, can carry that size of thing. Let's see if we have any questions about that. Um, okay, so we do have a couple of questions. Um, I do not know what the bag or backpack rules are. I don't think there are any. Um, at the at the convention center, um, a large perk would, purse would work. I usually carry a crossbody bag, um, just so that I don't have a lot of weight on like one side or the other in my back because you're walking and and I have my hands free and things like that or a backpack. Um, somebody else said uh, I don't see a place to register for the Greg Abbott event on Thursday. Um, that's a separate Eventbrite registration. Um, so I would, uh, encourage you to either search on Eventbrite for that, or, uh, if you'll email me, my contact information will be at the end. I'll be happy to, to forward you that. If you didn't send in your phone number to the state convention, they might not have texted you. So that may be why you didn't get that information. Um, and there just to note, there's a couple people looking for roommates on the thread here. So I encourage you to look for that. If that's something that you, uh, still need to do. So this last little bit is a really fun topic of parliamentary procedure. <laughs> um, this may get a little dry, but it's definitely very important. The more people who understand uh, what, we're, what we're doing here um, and how to do it properly, the smoother and easier our convention will go. Uh, before I get, somebody asked about a clear purse. I don't think you have to have a clear purse, just to clarify. So parliamentary procedure. Um, there should be, based on years past, floor parliamentarians that are at these big stanchions with lights on them. And we'll go over the lights in a minute. Um, they should be able to assist you in figuring out what kind of motion you have, if it's an er interrupting motion, um, so forth and so on, or if um, what you're trying, or to advise you on what you're trying to do. Um, because sometimes you'll say, you know, I want to do this. What am I supposed to say to, to, to do this, right? So they should be able to assist you in that. But you want to be as prepared as possible. So let's talk about it. Um, if you're wanting to seek recognition, uh, you would, in a Senate District Caucus, you would stand up and you would say, you know, Madam Chair or whatever, um, you know, and then the, the chair would say, you know, I recognize, you know, 
the delegate in the blue shirt or whatever it is, how, if they know your name, they'd say your name. Um, if it's a general session, then you would go to a microphone and they would turn on a specific light and then they would say microphone four, you're now recognized, you know, for what purpose do you rise type thing. Right. Um, and then, uh, you'll, you'll introduce yourself. Anytime you speak at a microphone, you need to introduce yourself. So in my case, I would, if I was in a Senate district caucus, I would say, Cassie Daniel Howell, Williamson County, because I'm with everybody else in Senate District 24. If I was on the floor of the convention, I would say Cassie Daniel Howell, Senate District 24, right? So we just wanna identify where you're from and then you'll state whatever purpose that you're, you're standing at and we'll get into what those look like. Um, these are the lights, you don't need to memorize this. They will know the light system. I will tell you right now, that blinking white light will be the bane of your existence by the time you adjourn on Saturday. Everybody thinks they got a point of order or something like that. That's really just their opinion about whatever the last person said. <laughs> um, so if we really know our parliamentary procedure, uh, then hopefully we can avoid a lot of those um, out of order motions, which waste a lot of time. Uh, so debate. So we're going to use the example. Uh, I'm Cassie Daniels, Senate District 24. I moved at a plank to the platform that M&Ms be the official state candy of Texas, right? Um, so I've made my motion. Um, and then uh, I have the opportunity, well, there has to be a second to that motion, right? What is it? Second, right? Uh, and then we start speaking in favor and against the person who made the motion gets to speak first. So I would get up there and say, well, M&Ms are fabulous. They melt in your mouth and not in your hand. Uh, they're owned by a Texas company. They're bright, bright, cheerful colors. They come in a variety of flavors, peanut, almond, milk, chocolate, you know, uh, and that's why they ought to be the official state candy of Texas. Right. And then they'll say, is there anybody who speaks in opposition? Well, there's somebody who just hates M&Ms and it really prefers Skittles, right? So let's say, I think it ought to be Skittles. And I said, well, that's not in order. You could speak against M&Ms, but it's not in order just to say, I think it ought to be Skittles. You could later amend the motion and strike M&Ms and insert Skittles, which we'll get to. Um, but let's say they're just speaking in opposition. I don't like M&Ms. Some people don't like chocolate. That shouldn't be the official state candy of Texas, right? And we go back and forth until there's nobody else to talk or we have maxed out on the for and against speeches or somebody calls a previous question, which we're gonna talk about. Um, just as a reminder though, I'm not telling that guy that he doesn't know what he's talking about with those Skittles, right? It's the whole convention that's debating this motion. So I'm addressing my remarks to the chair, you know, uh, Mr. Chairman, this is why M&Ms are the greatest thing on God's green earth, right? Um, Anyway, so just remember that and, and everything has to be confined to the merits of what we're talking about. So if we're not talking about Skittles right now or Snickers or any other candy bar, you have to talk about the merits of making M&Ms the official state candy of Texas because that at the time is the motion uh, in front of the body. So uh, next up, we'll keep going with debate. Um, Unless the rules tell us something different, the supplemental rules that the rules committee puts out, um, debate can't exceed five minutes for a main motion and no more, no more than three minutes on amendments after that. Um, and like I said, it should go between uh, in favor and, and an opposition. And the idea there is if everybody thinks m and m should be the state candy, we don't need to hear five people tell us that, you know? Um, we lovingly had a saying for the SREC, but it applies to most, most deliberative bodies. Here's the quote. It's all been said, but not by everyone, right? So don't go up to the mic and say, yeah, that's a great idea. We should do what that guy said. We already heard what that guy said. We don't need you to tell us what that guy said, right? So if we have five people go up and all say the same thing, we've now wasted a lot of time for a whole lot of people, right? So the point of the debate is to point something else out or make something else known, uh, not to just keep saying the same thing over and over and over again. Um, I will say the SREC, when I first started working there, there was a lovely lady named Jean McIver. 
uh, who was on the SREC, and she would get up every single time and make the MacGyver motion, which is, or the MacGyver rule, excuse me, um, that there would be three people for, three people against at three minutes apiece, right? We should be able to hash it out by that time. Now you could always, the, the body could always say, no, this is something that needs more debate. We should continue to debate this. And you could, you know, uh, make, move to extend debate, right? Um, so you can do that, but also keep in mind, the more time you spend on one topic, that's a hundred other topics that aren't being discussed. So we need to be really resourceful with our time. We cannot as a whole body possibly debate every single plank in the platform. It's just not possible or every single rule or every single legislative priority. It's just not possible. Right. So, um, you know, Pick the hill that you want to fight for um, if you feel like there's something you need to say, but I would really encourage you if there's something you're passionate about on being included or not being included, you need to talk to your committee members because they're doing the massive bulk of the work prior to the convention during the temporary committees and then just you know, dotting the I's and crossing the T's when the permanent committee members are elected. So that's really where we need to do the work. That's why the system's set up the way it is for that grassroots involvement and participation. So here's some basic motions, and we're going to go through those. We have a main motion. And so that's, I want to bring something forward. For example, I said, you know, I move that uh, M&Ms be the official state candy of Texas. And I'll say, you'll not only make me, but also my debate coach from high school, Mrs. Hall, very, very happy if you use the correct proper phrase of, I move to whatever, or I move that whatever. You never get up and say, I make a motion. That's the action that you're taking. You are making a motion, but you say, I move to do whatever in the fill in the blank. It'll also show the people who know what's up that you know what's up and it provides some legitimacy to what you're about to offer to the, to the committee or the uh, Senate district or the convention as a whole, depending on where you're doing that. Um, you can amend a motion by one of these things. Like before we struck M&Ms and we inserted Skittles. Or maybe you want to add something. You think that this is such a phenomenal idea. You want to add that every Texan is required to carry a packet of M&Ms at all times, right? You could add that to the motion. Um, or somebody could say, oh, I want to strike at all times and say only on weekdays, right? I don't know. This is very silly and I recognize that, but it's hopefully getting the point across. <laughs> um, so that's what you would do to amend a motion. Um, remember, you can limit or extend debate, um, and it just takes a majority vote to do that. The previous question, this is one of my favorite tools. Um, let's say you're really sick about hearing of M&Ms, and you probably are, and so you want to move the previous question. What does that do, right? That freezes whatever's going on. So we're talking about M&Ms, Skittles, whatever, candy, yada, yada, yada. You go, I move the previous question. Or you can say, I call the question. And what that is, is it freezes debate. And then we take a vote to see, does the majority of the body feel like we've discussed this enough and we can move on? And so you'd say, okay, we're now voting on the previous question, which will end debate on this measure. All in favor say aye, all opposed say nay, in the opinion of the chair. In this case, let's say the ayes have it. Well, then you go on to actually vote on whatever's in front of you, right? Okay. Um, and so at that time, you'll actually be voting to make, make M&Ms the official state candy of Texas and that every Texan has to carry one uh, with them at all times, right? That, that's the measure we're voting, voting on. Everybody clear. All in favor say aye. All opposed say nay, right? Pending the chair, whoever has it, right? Uh, if the previous question fails, then we go back to right where we were before the question was called and we continue that debate whether it's for or against, right? So it stays in the same order. It only takes a majority vote for the previous question to pass once it's called. I'm gonna go back over to, uh, ba, 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 ba. okay, there's a lot coming in. Um, okay, some of the, Maria, I'm gonna answer those later. Um, the previous question does not require a second, I believe. I could be wrong. If I'm wrong, somebody correct me. I, I don't think it does. Um, 
committee, actually it might, I will have to look that up. Uh, I know that committee reports do not require a second because it, there's more than one person who's agreed upon that. And so when like the um, platform committee comes up uh, to give their report, their report doesn't require a second. It is the report and we begin debate. Okay, thank you, Patty. I, was, I wasn't sure. So yes, previous question does require a second. And like I said, the vast majority of things do because the idea if it's only one person's in favor of it, then that answers the question. We don't have to take time to stop and vote or whatever else is going on, right? Um, if they only, if only one person wants that particular candidate, not a single other person there is even willing to second the nomination, then we're not going to move forward with that candidate, right? So, um, again, thank you, uh, thank you, Patty. Okay, uh, just a few more slides here. A parliamentary inquiry. This is really important. Um, that is to get information about what you want to do, like parliamentary inquiry. If I would like to um, take a break for a few minutes so we can read over this new language, what would I say to make that happen? That would be a parliamentary inquiry. That's different than a request for information. That would be um, what particular are we voting on right now? What is the measure before the body? Or where can I get a copy of whatever? Right. Um, and then the all favorite point of order, the poo. Um, a lot of people just like to yell out point of order, right? Because it's an interrupting motion. And um, then they say, going back to our Eminem analogy, point of order. A lot of people are allergic to peanuts. And so we shouldn't allow people to carry peanut MMs. Well, that's not an order. That's not a point of order. That's you giving us an opinion, right? A point of order is hey, I don't think we seconded that motion or I don't think the, um, the amendment is written correctly as it was you know, given to us or whatnot. So that's to, to stop because something is out of order, right? So that's why you're pointing it out because it's out of order. Um, so that relates to parliamentary procedure. And then you can also appeal the decision. It, like when we went back, we talked about the types of voting when there's the voice vote and you say, okay, well, the you know, opinion of the chair, the, the eyes have it. And you go, I think that girl was a drum major and she just yelled really loud. I don't really think the eyes have it. So I, you could appeal the decision of the chair. Um, is that one example um, of, of using that tool? So that's the end of the training. Uh, we'll go through the questions that are still in uh, the chat there. This is my contact information, my personal information, my cell phone and my personal email. If you have any questions, that we don't get to or is very specific and I direct you to email me or call me about that or text me, um, please, please utilize that. Um, we are recording this training and we will send out the PowerPoint presentation um, to you, to, to uh, the folks that we sent this information out to. But if you feel like you're not going to get that or you might have missed it, feel free to email me or reach out as well. So moving over to the questions. Um, uh, so somebody asked a question about registering for convention. Um, they said, does everyone have to register for $69 or as a delegate, are we already registered? Um, you have to register yourself. You are not like pre-registered by somebody else. Your name and information was sent forward um, stating that you are a delegate that should be credentialed for convention, but that did not register you for the convention. So I hope that clears that up. As I said before, as a delegate or alternate, you're not required to pay the facility fee, but we highly encourage you to do so because it costs a whole heck of a lot uh, to put on these conventions, rent the space, all that good stuff. So this is a, it's, I think, uh, Former Chairman uh, Steve Mysteri was on a call last night. I think he said it's less than a fifth of the cost of the convention. Um, so it's still uh, still important to kind of pay that forward. Um, somebody else is asking about the event for Governor Abbott's welcome reception. Um, I would, uh, if, if you're not getting the information, email me and we'll make sure that you get that link. Um, Jason, thank you for pointing out, unless you buy a ticket for a meal, there is no food included except for that welcome reception with the governor. 
but don't expect a five course meal at that, you know, they'll have food, but, um, you know, uh, just, just make sure that you're aware that meals are not covered with that facility fee, like the champion of freedom lunch. Yes. That covers the meal for lunch, but that's a separate ticket that you're purchasing. Or if you do the congressional lunch or the RPT gala, um, those things will have food, but those are a second separate ticket purchase. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Um, I'm not, okay, here we go. Oh, somebody's asking about the CHL. Um, I do not know what the current rules are. Um, I would, I would direct you to the, um, the convention, um, facility website and see what they say about that. Um, I know we had a question the other night. Some of the hotels are not, con are not, uh, carry friendly and, um, you know, if they, if they have the signage up there, then follow the law. <laughs> um, I know there's some people who, um, you know, and again, I would also say just be responsible and check in advance. And that way, you know, what hotel you're staying at and things like that. Um, but not, not working at the party. I don't know the answer to those particular questions. Um, picking up credentials. Uh, they're all in one place at the, at the, the South showroom at the convention center, and then they'll be by Senate district. And again, that's the Senate district that you voted in, in this primary election, the one that's on your voter registration card. Uh, the special event schedule is included uh, in that in that event schedule. There will still be other things like my very first convention in 2006. Um, the lady who got my parents involved in politics was there and she found out that I was a delegate for the first time. And she uh, had an extra ticket for the Eagle Forum dinner. And so I got to, to go to that and hear Phyllis Schlafly and uh, Louis Gohmert speak. And that was a really amazing experience for me. Um, that event's not on the calendar because it's a separate event that's happening at the convention. And some of those things, you'll either already be associated with a group like, um, like TFRW or something like that, that's having an event there um, that has a separate ticket to purchase or things like that. Um, but there, there are lots of other events that happen in conjunction with the convention that are not technically like convention events, uh, if that makes any sense. So uh, definitely, oh, and Jason put the Eventbrite link in there. Thank you, Jason, uh, for the Abbott event. So uh, if you'll scroll back up about 856, he posted that link. Um, Sorry, I, we had a lot of things come in. Okay. Um, I don't know about food in the convention hall. Um, I jokingly say like the last, last national convention, well, the worst one I went to was Tampa, the national convention there. They had those like little kind of shots of water <laughs> for $5. <laughs> and then they had like two chicken strips and some, and some fries. It was like the only thing to eat. And that was 10 bucks, you know? Um, so I wouldn't really plan on a lot of food, but I don't know what their setup is. Um, if somebody else has some information on that, please chime in. Um, and then um, Rachel is saying you can open carry according to a security meeting she went to. So um, I don't know which Rachel that is. I'm taking a guess, but uh, you know, again, trust, but my, one of my favorite presidents, Ronald Reagan, trust, but verify. Um, so if you have a question, the information is probably on the website, texasgop.org or on the individual hotel or the convention center. Um, there is a young Republican alumni event there that has a Facebook link. Um, parking. I do not know the uh, answer about the cost for parking. I know that there is parking. Um, I would also uh, encourage you, if you're not in an area that normally has like an Uber or a Lyft, uh, some of our more rural areas aren't familiar with using those. I would encourage you to download one of those apps just so you do have another um, option if you need transportation, um, you know, between things. Um, somebody else is saying it was $45 a day um, and they only take credit cards. So again, yeah, have some cash, have some credit cards uh, just so that you have an option. Um, bum, bum, bum. Okay, I think that is everything. Um, so if you do have any other questions, feel free to reach out. I'm so excited that we have 
uh, you know, several hundred people that have been on this training and that are going to be prepared to go to convention. And just thank you for taking the time to go to convention and participate in the process. And uh, again, thank you, Tony Ann, for continuing to be a leader. Same, uh, President Whitehill, thank you for your leadership and making sure that our members are informed uh, so we can be active, uh, productive participants in this process. Thank you so much, Cassie. This was fabulous. And um, thank you so much to everybody who was on here. I'm so glad y'all wanted to be informed. And this was great. Tony Ann, did you have anything you wanted to say at the end? No, just I'm excited to see everyone. Hello. Please come up and say hello. I, I can't yeah. wait next week. You know. Thank you again, Cassie. This was fabulous. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs>